Welcome to the Neuroendocrine Cancer UK Q&A session on the subject of hormones. This series of Q&A sessions has been created as part of the Neuroendocrine Cancer UK Virtual Patient Handbook, which is due to be released in 2023. My name is Beth and I'll be hosting these sessions with various medical experts, covering a range of questions within neuroendocrine cancer care. Although I've worked with Neuroendocrine Cancer UK for a little while now, I'm not a medical professional myself, and so in many ways I'm learning alongside you, the audience. Some of the questions I'll be asking have been taken directly from the neuroendocrine cancer community, and the focus of these sessions will be on providing useful information and advice in a concise audio-visual format. In this session, Dr. John Ayak will be answering a range of questions on hormones, but firstly, let's get to know him a little better. Hello, Beth. My name is John Ayuk, and I'm a consultant endocrinologist working at University Hospitals Birmingham. And I'm a core member of our neuroendocrine tumor service and have been for the last 15 years. Thanks, John. So um, as we know, hormones are responsible for many of our body's everyday functions. And with neuroendocrine cancer, an abnormal increase or decrease can result uh, in patients experiencing unwanted symptoms and syndromes. So that's why we felt it was important to include a Q&A session uh, about hormones. And we hope to dig a little deeper into um, some specific hormones, as well as some broader information about the um, uh, endocrine system later in the Q&A. So to begin with, um, we're going to be talking, uh, kind of mentioning serotonin. So are antidepressants safe to use when you have neuroendocrine cancer, bearing in mind that we know that excess serotonin is associated with carcinoid syndrome, carcinoid heart disease, mesenteric fibrosis in people with neuroendocrine cancer? Um, so would, would, you know, for example, SSRIs, would they be safe for somebody to, to use when they have neuroendocrine cancer? Thank you, Beth. That's a very interesting question. Now, as we know, serotonin is linked to mood. So one of the things we know about is that in depression, people tend to have uh, low serotonin levels. And actually, many of the medications used to treat depression, the way they work is by increasing your brain levels of serotonin. Now, as you mentioned, from our point of view, when we're dealing with neuroendocrine cancers, too much serotonin is a bad thing, not a good thing. Mm. And so there have been some questions raised about how safe antidepressants are in patients who have neuroendocrine tumors, because the feeling is, you know, we're already worried about the effects of the high serotonin levels and giving them antidepressants may increase the serotonin levels further. There have, you know, there's there's been some research done looking at this. I must say most of it not very high quality research. And the results have been controversial. But I like to refer to um, a paper which was done a couple of years ago, where actually what they did was looked at all of the research papers out there, looked at the best quality ones, and tried to pull from those any, you know, the evidence uh, to, or any evidence to um, see whether treating people who have neuroendocrine cancers with antidepressants have any deleterious effects. And the good news is they did not find any significant difference between patients with neuroendocrine cancers who were treated with um, antidepressants compared to those who were not treated with antidepressants. So at this stage, there is no clear evidence to suggest that patients with neuroendocrine cancers who are treated with antidepressants are put at any disadvantage or put at any greater risk. And obviously, you know, with a, con a chronic and serious condition like neuroendocrine uh, tumor disease, it's not surprising that some patients will feel down, will feel depressed about the um, condition. And what we really don't want is for these patients not to be put on appropriate treatments to help them because someone's worrying about the impact this will have on their serotonin levels. Because there are um, there are antidepressants that aren't relating to serotonin. Would That's that correct. be would that be something that a clinician might think to recommend instead 
in, in case that there's that kind of too much of an increase for somebody or? So not being a psychiatrist, I don't really know the differences. At what point, you know, uh, a psychiatrist will decide to treat someone with one of the ones which does increase certain levels, levels as opposed to a different what one which works through a different mechanism. So I can't comment, but I think what I would like to stress is that if a patient who's got a neuroendocrine cancer and is feeling depressed, needs treatment, they should be afforded whatever treatment the treating doctor feels is best. And it shouldn't be influenced by the fact that they've got neuroendocrine tumor disease. Okay, thank you. So uh, on to the secretion of, of um of hormones, specifically of histamines. Um, can the hypersecretion of histamines and other bioactive substances cause symptoms? Um, and is there evidence for this? So yes, you know, even outside of the context of neuroendocrine um, tumor disease, we know that the body can secrete other sort of agents like histamines, like uh, bradykinins and so on, which do have an effect on the body. and you know, as you know, our common, uh, very common anti-allergy medications are, many of them are antihistamines, aren't they? So yes, even outside of that context, there's, you know, a whole lot of evidence that the, uh, the body can secrete too much of these other substances and they can cause symptoms. In the context of neuroendocrine tumor disease, we also know that the neuroendocrine tumors, although the main hormone we tend to sort of focus on is serotonin, that they do produce other hormones as well, including some quantities of histamine, some quantities of uh, bradykinins, but the main one we focus on because that's presumably the one which is produced in the greatest quantities is the serotonin. Okay, so related to that, how do you choose which bioactive substances are tested for? So there, there's a couple of things that you need to bear in mind when you're trying to think about you know, any marker for any disease, you know, whether you're going to check it. First is it has to be something which can be measured and measured reliably. So we've, you know, to, because you believe it or not, there are still sort of substances, which it is, you know, even with all of our advanced technology, which is, which are quite difficult to measure reliably, reliably in a laboratory. And so first of all, it has to be something which can be measured reliably and you know, we know that if we get a result, it's a true result. It's not just a, you know, it's not going to be a completely wildly different result when we try to do the test again. So that's one thing. Secondly, it needs to be a marker which reflects the disease which we're trying to, you know, to, to treat or to monitor. It needs to, there's no point checking a marker which, like I said, fluctuates within the disease but doesn't you know, doesn't tell you whether the disease is more severe or less severe, whether it's come back, whether it's not come back. We want a marker which does reflect the disease. So we want a marker where if the person hasn't got the disease, the levels are very low or non-existent. If they get disease, the levels are detectable. If the disease worsens, those levels go higher to give us an idea. If we do a treatment and the treatment is successful, those levels come down. Mm -hmm. And with neuroendocrine tumors at the moment, the may, I'm sure you're aware there are new markers being look, uh, looked at, but at the moment, the main mar marker which we tend to rely on is basically serotonin through the measurement of the urine 5-HIAA levels. Uh, oh, so actually, what are the new markers being looked at? So, I mean, if the, the I'm sure you've heard of the NET test. Mm. Yes. So things like that, where people are looking at, in fact, it's not just single markers, but groups of, of, of other markers, which are put together. And I think they're put into these complex um, computer algorithms, and they work out a score almost. They, they, um, all of, they put all of the information together and work out a score. And that's that can be used as um, a marker for disease progression. Again, like I said, all of this at the moment is still more or less experimental. You know, there are some molecular markers which are on the horizon people are looking at. And, you know, um, I'm sure you've also heard about circulating tumor cells and things like that. So, you know, so there's, there's a lot happening. And we do hope that in the next few years, we will come up with some more reliable markers.
Hmm. Okay. Um, so kind of back to, um, you know, talking about symptoms and syndromes and, and the secretion of hormones, why is it that um, only some neuroendocrine cancer patients experience symptoms and syndromes um, from the secretion of hormones? Okay, so again, that's a very interesting question. And I think, you know, the reason for this is actually quite fascinating and just shows you how wonderful the human body is. So most of the uh, neuroendocrine tumors we deal with are in the gut. And so they're producing these hormones in the gut. And what happens is the hormones get absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream. And because all of the, the blood from the gut goes through the liver before it goes to anywhere else in the body, what happens is the liver actually metabolizes these hormones, mainly the serotonin, the liver metabolizes that. And so when the blood comes out of the liver to go to the rest of the body, it no longer has the active hormones in it. And that's why for most patients, especially early on in the disease, they will not get symptoms because all of the um, hormone is being metabolized in the liver before it gets to the rest of the body. However, once patients deliver, sorry, once patients develop liver metastases, that becomes an issue because the liver can no longer work as well as it was before at, mm. you know, uh, metabolizing these ho hormones and getting rid of them, inactivating them. And so the hormones start, start to slip through the liver. So even though they get to the liver, they're able to slip through because the uh, liver can't metabolize them. Mm. And then they go to the rest of the body and they cause syndromes. Mm. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to this where... Sometimes, you know, certainly in, in some of the the the, um, the pelvic uh, tumors, some of those can drain directly into the bloodstream without going through the liver. Mm. And therefore, you know, the hormones get the chance to go around the body and cause symptoms. So that so is it that most people that are experiencing symptoms and syndromes have liver metastases? Yes, the majority of them will have different majority, metastases. But not yes, all. Not okay. All. okay, interesting, yeah. Um, all right, so on to our last question. Um, so this is about endocrine disruptors, um, which, are, you know, probably people have heard a bit about in the media um, over the years. Um, so just from your point of view, it'd be interesting to know how worried should we be about endocrine disruptors in the home uh, or the environment? And is there any research into this? So again, a very interesting question. And um, again, this is something which I'm not an expert in. So uh, most of my knowledge of this comes from just, you know, having that interest as an endocrinologist and reading around what evidence there is out there. Now, endocrine disruptors, I think the first thing to say is we know they exist. And we know for certain that in high enough quantities, they will cause disruption to endocrine systems. The big question and the big controversy is whether the quantities we have in the home, in the environment, are enough to cause those disruptor effects or not. And there, you know, if you look at the existing evidence, the jury is out because there are studies which suggest that, yes, they, you know, these endocrine disruptors are, you know, significant, the quantities are significant enough to cause problems. And there are other studies which show they don't, or they're not um, in, in those quantities, they're not enough to cause us any problems. As you can imagine, with these disruptors being all around us, it's actually very difficult to carry out, you know, nice, clean research to answer that question. So my suspicion is this is going to be a controversial topic for many, many years to come. Now, in the context of neuroendocrine tumors, there's certainly no credible research I have seen which links endocrine disruptors with, you know, either an increase in the frequency or a worsening of neuroendocrine tumor disease. Okay, thank you. 
Um, all right, so that's the end of the Q&A session. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ayak, for joining me today. Um, I found it really interesting. And um, for those watching, I hope that this video on hormones has been useful for you. For those interested, this Q&A session is part of a series where I speak to various medical experts covering a range of questions within neuroendocrine cancer care. So keep an eye out for those. And thank you again, John. My pleasure.